Hey guys, our good friend Ron Felber joins us, and he's got a new book coming out, and boy, is it a doozy. I'll be right back. Grab your popcorn and snacks. Find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, with a small dash of pixie dust, turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Hey everybody, happy Thursday. How's everybody doing? I hope you said well. I'm doing well. So far, we've had Murphy's Law coming in to play with the show, but uh, we're here finally live. Sorry, Ron. Ron's in, the, Ron's in the green room waiting. It happens. It is a happening day. But I'm looking forward to the weekend. I hope you guys are. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour. We're actually going to be doing our first uh, our first pre uh, residential prelim in a long time. The group's going out to do a prelim to, to, to help this family locally here in Sacramento in need. So we're going to be doing that. Anyway, we got a great show. I mean, I've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, Ron, my guest, Ron Felber, is one of my most favorite authors. I have I only have about four or five favorite authors, and he happens to be one of them. However, there's four books, and I'm going to tell you guys the onset of this interview. There's four books out there that have scared me to death. Two of them are written by Ron. One of them is written by an author that we're going to be discussing during this interview as well. The other book, I have no clue. The other book was really creepy. Uh, it had to do with, with, with some plane crash victims out of, you know, out of this area in England. And it was so scary that my, my father even would leave the lights on after he read it. And I used to pass it on to my friends and, and, and people I knew and, and teachers and stuff when I was in high school. And somewhere along along the, the book disappeared. I have no idea what the hell it's called. But I mean, that book was scary. But these two books of Ron's, yeah, they're, they're scary. And we're going to be talking about the new book that, that he has coming out. And I'm excited about it. In fact, we're going to be talking about the book cover because it's kind of related to the book cover of another well-known movie and story. I noticed that right off. But anyhow, here we go. If you like what you see tonight and you're watching from Facebook and a lot of you are, please feel free to to uh, join us. Follow us. Doesn't cost anything to follow us. I do a show every night, Sunday through Sunday through Friday. And I did, and uh, you guys different topics. Not just the same topic. Sometimes I don't cover paranormal stuff at all. Sometimes I cover other stuff like the opioid epidemic or uh, like the other night, plastics. You know, how plastics are kind of ruining our our, our bodies and, and, and things like that. So I don't always cover this covered like paranormal topics. I'm a newspaper reporter by trade and I'm a general assignment reporter, which means I'm the, I'm the one that does a little bit of everything. So that's why I like to cover a little bit of everything. So you're not, I don't think you'll ever be bored watching the show. If you're over at YouTube and you're watching from YouTube tonight and you haven't subscribed, please feel free to do that as well. Because, you know, there's 900 videos and they're all this show and they're all, again, they're all different topics. So you can spend hours going through everything over there. I, and I mean hours. I put some of this stuff in, under categories. You like Medium Nancy Mass? She's got her own category. You like UFOs and things like that? That's got its own category. So you just have to click on the folder and you can find whichever ones you want to watch. Also, if you're watching from them and almost any other social media site like Twitch and you like what you see, show me some love. Leave me a thumbs up. Leave me a happy heart, happy face. Because what that does, and oh yes, and please comment in the chat room. Thank you for reminding me, producer. Please comment in the chat room. Because what that does is it, it triggers the computers at Facebook and YouTube and all those other places, and it distributes the show out to more people. Because they see, you know, they see interested people, you know, actually taking part in the show. Okay? So that's all I ask. That's all I ask. I want to make one more note before we start, and I can't wait to talk with Ron, so that's why I'm trying to push this through real fast. I am teaching a psychic development class one on March 10th, 3 p.m. Pacific. 
It'll be online. StreamYard, it's a private room for everybody. There's only nine spots open. But if you think you might have psychic abilities and you'd like to have them, see if you can bring them out, this is the class for you. Head over to the California Haunts Meetup. All you got to type in, Google California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team Meetup. And you're in. Okay, let's get to Ron. I'm so excited. Ron Felber wrote this book called The Mojave Incident. And I had him on the show talking about it a while back. And if you're into UFO stories and UFO abduction and contactee stories, this is the one for you. This will scare you and keep you up at night. All right. Anyhow, he has written another book, which is the one we're going to discuss tonight. And I'm going to let him tell you about it because I don't want to, I don't want to mess up the details. I have read the book and I was up at night. Lights on, the whole ball game. Things scared the hell out of me. So let me bring him in and uh, you can meet Ron Felber. Hello. How are you, Charlotte? Good to see you. I'm scared. Thank you again for scaring me. <laughs> I don't want to scare you. <laughs> Good to see you. It's good to see you too. It's been, it's a, been while. a while. It's yeah. been a while. It's, it's been, been a while. A of, a, of a gap between the Mojave incident and the unwelcome, the curious case of Clara Fowler. But um, it, it's amazing how, even though there's a gap in time, these two books are related in, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of related, I want to talk to you about the cover for this, okay? Yeah. Because when I saw it, I know it made me think of another book as well. Another book, another, or shall we say, movie as well. Yes. Okay? Yes. So whoever designed this cover, and I'm going to run it right now, whoever designed this cover did a good job of not causing copyright infringement. <laughs> but still got the feel of it, right? Still got the feel of it. <laughs> And anybody who's seen this other particular movie or this other particular book will recognize what I'm talking about right away. I mean, this is awesome. That's scary in, in itself. That is it's just a wonderful scary. cover. I have to say the publisher did a great job. As soon as I saw it, I said, this is it. You know, we yeah. don't need to see any others. It'll be interesting. Has, now, before we mention any names of, of, you know, who's connected to this particular book, has he seen the cover? Well, you know, you know actually, uh, Bill, Bill Blatty, Passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. Passed away, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, is a very dear friend. And um, our relationship goes back to 1972 when I was a student at uh, Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. And they were filming The Exorcist. There you go. So I was a sophomore and they had the streets flooded with fog, you know, mm -hmm. around the tombs, mm -hmm. appropriately named, I guess. You know, in Georgetown, it's the bar that the, the college kids go to. And um, I had a manuscript, my first book, my first novel. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, people that are writers, you know, they're sort of on fire with their, their first book. You know, they're on fire. Right. And so I would do anything because he was he had had a, a bestseller, The Exorcist, of course, right. Right. which was on the bestseller list for 56 weeks. You know, it, it sold 15 million copies. And so I said, you know, if. I can get him to read my book, even though it has typos in it. And, it, you know, I was a kid, right. et cetera. If I can get him to read it and he likes it, maybe he'll help me get it published. So actually, um, they were staying, the, the crew were staying at the Marriott Key Bridge, which is across uh, the Key Bridge from, from Georgetown, across the Potomac. And I met with the, uh, his administrative assistant. And she was uh, a very nice woman. And I said, you know, I have this manuscript, you know, I'm a writer on fire. I'm just like Bill Blatty was. He went to Georgetown. I said, I'm a sophomore. I please give him this manuscript or I'd like to meet him. Oh, you can't meet him. No, fine. Just give him the manuscript. She said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put it in the pile behind me. And there was this mountain of manuscripts, literally from all over the world in Germany, France, England, piled up. I said, no, 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 not that. Please, please just give it to him. Tell him he grew up in, uh, in uh, uh, the Bronx, New York, uh, poor. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, not rich. And um, we both were on scholarship to Georgetown for, for merit scholarship and writing, actually, for writing. I said, I'm just like, tell him, I'm, ju I'm him. Just a difference in time. 
So, so please just tell him that. She said, I'll tell you what, I will tell him just what you said and I'll give him the manuscript, but that's where it ends. What happens after that? I, I, you know, I'm, my hands are clean. Mm -hmm. So I went to, uh, to Thanksgiving holiday back in New Jersey where my parents lived. And I got a phone call from Bill Blatty and he said, uh, I like your manuscript. When you come back from vacation, the holiday, uh, come see me. I'd like to discuss it with you. And, and we had a, a really great friendship for many years. And, uh, and he's the one that uh, gave me this story. He said, you know, I, I, I was going to write it. I used it for my research, but I, I'm on to other things. I decided to go a, a different path. So let me give you this story. It's, it's an incredible documented to the, to the T story. The records of this case, the case of Clara Fowler, are at the Harvard Medical School Library. Wow. It took place uh, the turn of the century, 1898 to 1905 in Boston. She was studied by the, the famous uh, uh, para, uh, paranormal uh, psychiatrist and uh, uh, abnormal psychiatrist, William James, Dr. Morton Prince, uh, a fellow named Richard Ho Hogson, who was the president of the uh, Society of Psychic Researchers for mm -hmm. New England, and Leonora Piper, who was the, the, probably the most famous clairvoyant at the time, and then George Waterman. So you had three Harvard Medical School professors mm -hmm. and, and practitioners, a clairvoyant, and uh, Hogson, who was a, a spiritualist, basically, studying this case of demonic possession. Well, like I said, you did it to me again. And um, I think it's a crazy it takes, it really it takes a, a lot to scare story. me. And uh, you managed to do it twice with two books in a row. Can you tell us a little bit? I know you can't really go into a lot of detail because the book's due to be released. Mm -hmm. But when you started to research this book, I mean, what did it take? Did did did, did uh, Mr. Blatty hand you all the you know, research that he had done, or, or were no, you... no? Okay. He he uh, he just said what he did do was make a phone call to the curator uh -huh. at the uh, at the Harvard Medical School Library to give me admission to to look through these records, which was all I needed. But even beyond that, there were things about this story that I don't think Bill knew. Uh -huh. I hired a detective actually to help research and go back into records because we're talking, you know, 1898 uh -huh. uh, to 1905. So it's a while ago. And, um, you know, we uncovered some in incredible things. I call this a story of science, murder, and the paranormal. Now, when you were looking at this, I, I know you're a former police officer. Yes. Was there anything in here that made you, that, that raised your eyebrows when we were doing the research on here? Yeah, um, you see, this isn't well. I don't want to give too much away. It's a little bit, a little bit difficult, but I'll, I'll, I'll skirt around it a little bit and try sure, to answer absolutely. your question. Um, there was an assumption about um, about Clara's brother and sister who mm -hmm. died, and what I uncovered were some medical records that say they were murdered. Mm -hmm. And that really, really opened up a tremendous um, possibilities in terms of what was really going on. And so I think Bill knew the, um, the, the psychiatric records because they had uh -huh. transcripts, letters between them, and actually letters from the demonic presence to the what, what Prince called the saint who had visitations from the Virgin Mary and then this demonic presence, which was just pure evil, that uh -huh. hated her guts, that wanted her dead, so uh -huh. it could take over the body permanently. And it would write her letters. She'd wake up in the morning, you know, when are you going to put a bullet through your head? You know, you're, you know, you're worthless. You know, I'm the real Clara Fowler. Just, just really um, uh, eerie, uh -huh. I guess, uh -huh. eerie. Now it took a while for you to get to, you know, to, to you to get to the point where you were writing this book, because, like you said, you wrote the, you know, the, the Mojave incident, and then yes. there were a lot, a few, quite a few books in between. Yes. Why did it take you so long to get to this one? You, you have no idea, Charlotte. I tried to write this in 1973, 1974, 
Mm-hmm. And actually, I, I have an interesting story I'll tell you later, but I flew to California to uh, Blatty's uh, home in Malibu and hand delivered the manuscript for what I called Christabel at the time. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter was that um, I was, uh, you know, a kid and uh, one's writing skills, like a lot of things. Or let's say that you're a pianist, you know, if you're 15, maybe you're playing the piano very well. Mm-hmm. But then maybe you're 50 and now you have sophistication, you have uh, the ability to flexibility to do things that you couldn't do then. Mm-hmm. So it's like that with writing. So I was very good at setting a story currently. So I would write detective stories or I would write whatever kind of stories, but generally they took place in the current time. Mm-hmm. This going back, you know, a hundred and some years, not so easy. How did people talk then? Even though I had letters, I had transcripts. What oh. cigarettes did they smoke? What did they dress like? What was Sigmund Freud like when he spoke? Because there's actually dialogue, you know. And so William James, the same. And it was a little overwhelming. So I put it aside and I said, you know, I kept the old manuscript, kept all the research, photos, everything, newspaper clippings, kept it all. And I guess in the back of my mind, I said, someday I'm going to grow up and be able to write this story. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was about three years ago. And um, with the success of Mojave Incident, which was in the same genre, you know, the same kind right. of creepy, you know, eerie feeling uh, true story. I said, you know, let me let me give it another world. And I did. And it came very easily. I guess it's been percolating my brain for 50 years i i suppose and uh and it and it uh, came out came out much better i think it's my best book you know i've been thinking while you've been talking is um i've been using project gutenberg a lot mm-hmm. for books so i could read them without having any hassles you know there's a mm-hmm. lot of ghost stories on there I'm, I'm wondering did this ever appear in anything on project gutenberg that that, that you know of no okay. now this is a it's a matter of fact I have a trailer that I just made uh, for the book. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that I say is the book took 50 years to write, to come out, so 50 years in the making. But this story was buried for more like 100. And the interesting thing and why that is, is because the medical establishment was battling in those days against spiritualists. There were about 9 million spiritualists in the United States and Europe. Uh Arthur Conan Doyle, um, the author of Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes stories, um, Madame Curie. I mean, some famous uh, people, uh, Uh Charles Dickens. I mean, people that had real uh, bona fides. Uh And and, uh, the medical establishment wanted to do anything. So the last thing they wanted was for William James and Morton Prince and uh, George Waterman, all Harvard Medical School lecturers, uh-huh. to say, oh, by the way, it's demonic possession. You know, so of course they're going to come up with dissociation is what they called it. Uh-huh. But if you read Prince's book, which is called Dissociation of a Personality, and I have a copy. It's an old, old book. It, it was published in 1906. And, um, I, you know, I, this is one of the one of the sources that I had. Uh-huh. It's a much different story in real life than what you would read in medical textbooks and psychiatric books today. So they describe the demon, who he called the demon, and William James uh-huh. called the demon, and the saint. Uh, they called Sally. So they, they gave it a name. And, you know, t- to the modern eye, what they would show is totally false. They would say, oh, this is like uh-huh. a bratty you know, a bratty person, uh, you know, mischief, uh, mischievous, uh, you know, like like a spoiled brat kind of, but this uh-huh. isn't anything like what the, what really happened. And so this was all because they did that the last thing they wanted was to have this case diagnosed as demonic possession. But to the very end, both Leonor, Leonor Piper and Hogson believed up and down, and so did William James that it was demonic possession. Huh. But uh, uh, Prince was in a rivalry, too, with uh, Sigmund Freud. And uh, and that rivalry, he wanted to have a, a book 
uh -huh. uh, treatise that overshadowed Freud. And this was to be the book that did that. It didn't. It made him famous. They made a Broadway play out of it. Uh -huh. They made two movies out of it in 1920 and 1916, something like that. But uh, he never got the notoriety in, in the uh, world of uh, psychiatry that he wanted. Now, when you talk about it, it makes me laugh to hear you say that. Having to go back and figure out how they even talked back then, yeah. back in those days. How yeah. difficult was that? Did you have to go to a linguist or anything like that to try and figure all that out? Well, you know what I had? Uh, I, I had a lot of information in these files. So they had a stenographer for much of this that took uh, actual like court notes of the, of the hypnotic sessions, the retrogressive sessions, uh, the, the dialogue even between James and, uh, and uh, Prince. So I could, I could glean how people talked. And if I had to invent certain sections of, of um, a dialogue, just, just in the interest of the flow of the story, I was able to do that because I, I understood now how they spoke, the language that they used. And I modernized it a little bit too, because, you know, it's just uh, awkward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. So as a writer, when you're writing all this stuff down, and I know I've talked with other writers who write horror, did it affect you while you were writing it? I mean, I understand you were you used to be a police officer, so you know that that might keep you calm and stuff. But I mean, did you find yourself, you know, because from what I read the book, that would be stuff that would that would keep me looking over my shoulder even when I'm writing it. Charlotte, I'm going to scare you even more. I'm sorry to say, but uh, I transported federal prisoners, and I met guys that killed eighty people. You know, you I go. transported hitmen. I trans transported terrorists uh, for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And um, what I came to understand mm -hmm. is, is that evil is real. It's not some concept. It isn't mm -hmm. some excuse for the bad things people do. Mm -hmm. it, it is a predatory entity that I, I would say prowls the earth and preys on uh, on. on um, victims that maybe are a little too adventurous uh -huh. or victims that uh, maybe have have the collapse of their personality maybe schizophrenic uh -huh. and and it, it takes possession of those people and it's a it's a real thing that's what i've come to and the other thing i've come to is that we don't know anything about reality we have no idea if you look at quantum physics or if you look at you know, the more recent um, literature in the world of physics, Newtonian physics, which is the way you and I perceive things, is out the window. You know, basically the world is nothing like we perceive it. Uh, oh. Sir Francis Crick, who, who, who found, who co the co-founder of DNA, said the probability is zero that we see reality as it is. Wow. And so what I've learned is that what we see is sort of like icons mm -hmm. based on survival. How do you get food? How do you get water? How do you mate? How do you, you know, evolution. But behind that, it's a little like looking at your face in a mirror. You'll see your face. But what about your thoughts? What about your ideas? What about your background? What about the people you love? In other words, you, you see almost nothing of what's mm -hmm. really there. And that we can get back to ghosts and Marian visitations and demonic presence. I think um, I think that's just part of reality. Now, you know, you mentioned that, you know, there was a, the, the fact that the, there was a battle between, you know, the science, the, the, the real scientists yes. and the people that, that believed in all this stuff. Yes. Well, you know, really, that battle was going on for a long time. I mean, it's just within the last... And I can say this because being a ghost hunter like I am, yeah. it's just within the last uh, few years that people have accepted it more, even Absolutely. doctors and nurses and stuff. Because I can remember going over with my mother when she was had her dementia. And I knew she was seeing things that weren't part of the dementia. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I remember when the doctors would say, well, is she hallucinating? And I, and I looked at them and went, well, that depends on what you mean by hallucinations, because she's actually seeing other things as well. But they were okay with it. Yeah, but I've noticed the turnaround. I've noticed friends of mine that have gone to see psychiatrists that the psychiatrists are more are more open to it than they used to be. 
Yeah, so by the way, so uh, psychiatrist, but also scientist. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm reading a book right now by uh, Donald Hoffman, and he it's a book about Sir Francis Crick, uh, the, the founder of, of DNA, mm -hmm. and uh, some of his theories. But, uh, it, you know, I know we talk about UFOs and things of that nature, mm -hmm. but Crick, who, who won the Nobel Prize for science in 1958, so this is no lightweight. This is mm -hmm. one of the most brilliant people in the world mm -hmm. in the sciences, said that the, po the possibility of evolution being true would be the equivalent of a tornado going through a junkyard and leaving behind a 757 jet that took off and flew to Europe. It says the human brain is much too complex. And even now, when we talk about the human brain, what is consciousness? Mm -hmm. We have no real, no one has an idea. Where does consciousness come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, the argument I, I would have is, Consciousness is a is a a uh, a subset mm -hmm. of the soul. That's what I think. And so, so Francis Crick agrees. <laughs> that's right, really, that's really interesting. And the thing that interests me too is back <clears throat> at the time that this took place. Yes. That there was a, a group of people in England called the Society for Cyclic, the, the Society for C Cyclical Studies Institute. Yes. Bunch of famous ghost hunters came out of there, you know, the original ghost hunters. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that, that they didn't hear about this and get involved with this. Actually, I think they might have because um, okay. Richard Hogson was uh, the, the president of the New England chapter of the, um, the Society of Psychical Researchers. That's Is it. That's it. That's it. That's it? it? Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, so they did. As a matter of fact, he was a key element. And it's so interesting. Uh, for example, just at the very end, there's some dialogue with, with the demon that actually, you know, the demonic presence is talking, right. you know, is, right. and, um, uh, and the uh, Hoxon's fiance had died, okay. you know, died a tragic death. And uh -huh. he, one of the things that probably drew him to being a spiritualist and the idea of mediums and seances was that his, his, uh, future bride uh -huh. died in her early twenties. And it must have been, you know, it was devastating to him. She spent the rest of his life literally, searching for some way to, to reconnect mm -hmm. and uh actually the uh the demon has moments of clairvoyance and tells him you know you will die searching for your 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 lost love huh. and, and you'll find her in a way that you don't expect he died very shortly after this this uh, this case had uh, had um ended uh and again a, a, a tragic and unusual death well, you know, that's something that I've been told as an investigator to be careful of. Yes. When dealing with these types of cases, because we've run into a, three or four during our our team's career, you know, where it may not get you right away, <laughs> but at some point down the line, your health will go bad. Something will happen. It's, it's infection. Yeah. And, and actually, there's a, I just finished reading, which wasn't easy, uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, Devils at Luden, which is a uh, about the convent, maybe you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. where there's this epidemic of, of demonic possession happened at this uh, nunnery, mm -hmm. and they sent four priests to, uh, to stem it, you know, to, to put an end to it. Mm -hmm. Three of them uh, died you know, within two years of, of that uh, exorcism. And the other went insane and spent the last 25 years of his life in a lunatic asylum. Yeah. So the prospect of infection is, is very real. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, like I said, you know, we've seen health problems on our team, uh, you know, varying health problems. I mean, I never congestive heart failure and a couple other people ended up ill as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see it even with some of the paranormal investigators on TV. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That, you know, that, that, that have gotten sick and whatnot. So it's, it's not a game. You know, people go in thinking that, we'll, that what this is is a game. Let's, let's go in and look for ghosts and blah, 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 blah. But it's not all cut and dry like people think it is. I, I don't think it's a game. I don't think it's a game because I think it's real. And I think there are pernicious forces. And, if, and again, if, if, frankly, if you met some of the people I met transporting um, these prisoners, these guys that, again, had just killed for fun. I mean, just literally uh -huh. just like killing things, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, you 
talk with somebody like that for 15 or 20 minutes and believe me you will believe in the devil I can believe it. Well, Nancy Mass likes to say that if you are bad in your life, you're going to die bad, and that's how you're going to be. I think so. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the the simple equations that you hear, you know that 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 the courses of good and evil fight for the uh -huh. souls of yeah. human beings on a moment to moment basis, and uh, I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. Remember your mother telling you? I know my mother used to tell me this was a good angel on this side, and then the devil was on this side. So they were always battling back and forth. Yeah, there's this thing between the the white dog and the black dog, mm -hmm. and they're fighting for fighting for you, and they say which one wins. It says which one do you listen to? All right. Yeah. Which one do you feed? Yeah. Absolutely. How long did it take you to write this book? Well, again, I mean, if you look at it. Um, it in, in one sense, a long, long time, in a, a more literal sense, uh, about two years. Mm -hmm. But I had something going already. I'd already had a manuscript. I threw it out. I mean, I threw out the original manuscript that I'd written, mm -hmm. uh, but I had all the research done. And the research it alone took me a couple of years. I can see that. And where, and, and, you know, where did you find your research? I mean, what did you look through? You looked through Harvard, obviously, because you made yes. it Harvard. But what what other locations did you do researching? Because this had to be hard to research. Yeah, well, I, again, I hired a detective uh, for some genealogy. There was a, a uh, see what Prince did. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's it's really ironic. This uh, this woman, Clara Fowler, was a Radcliffe student from Radcliffe College. And she mm -hmm. was 22 or so. It turned out that she fell in love, once cured, with George Waterman, who was one of her doctors. They married. Okay. They disguised this whole story and used the name Christine Beauchamp uh -huh. instead of Clara Fowler. So just getting the real name Clara Fowler wasn't very easy because everything was eliminated. Everything was blacked out uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. yeah, with, a, with her name in it. So they used this pseudonym, but believe it or not, they got married. He continued his practice and she became a socialite in Boston. Wow. Isn't that <laughs> incredible? I mean, who, who, you couldn't invent these things, right? Wow. <laughs> if I, as a fiction writer, I don't think I'd ever come up with that, you know? Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. So, so he had a very vested interest in disguising a lot of the details. Right, right, right. And, and I can imagine you going through this stuff and hit that rabbit hole and have to dig all the way down. And you're digging away. I, I, I had a detective friend that, that was retired. He, he had a disability and he was just brilliant with the Internet. And, and you know, he was like a like a basset hound. You know, I mean, you put him on something, he he dug into right. it. So he went through all the genealogical records and we came up with the name Fowler. Then we found the father's background, who was was not a nice man. And then we found out the mother who had died, uh, died shortly after the death of uh, her, her daughter, not Clara, younger daughter, Bessie. Right. And, um, and the, the mysterious, uh, the mysterious uh, boyfriend and, 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 and um, uh, husband for a very short period of time uh -huh. uh, of Clara Fowler. And that, that name was disguised as Will Jones. And so try looking, you know, try figuring that where you, where do you go from there? But we tracked down the actual, uh, you know, the actual person, the background, and actually uh, he was uh, one of the murder victims in the end. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It Not a pleasant death. Me, I don't remember the name of the book, but it reminds me of that book where the, where, where the guy worked at a shoe factory and he was like basically, it was it was a famous movie. He was basically uh, related to the owner of the shoe factory, or to, to the guy that ran the shoe factory. Yeah. And uh, he was in love with Elizabeth Taylor. She was a socialite. Huh. And he had he had this girlfriend that wasn't a socialite, so he drowns her. Uh huh. Uh huh. Thinking that if he gets rid of her, that once she's out of the way, that that will free him enough to marry Elizabeth Taylor. But he gets caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they all turn his back on him. And it kind of, it kind of rings that bell with me. You know, when you were telling me that, oh yeah, they they, they changed her name so she could go on and be, be the spreading socialite. Yeah, I mean, I, if if uh, if they used her real name, I, I I think 
none of that could possibly have happened. So he really saved her life in a way. But really what he also did was deprive the medical community of a mm -hmm. lot of uh, and, and the and the spiritualist community, the paranormal community, whatever you want right. to call it. Right. Of, of some details that were very, very important that he purposely left out for two reasons. One, again, because he, he wanted to push the, his his scientific theories of dissociation and the other to hide the identity of uh, Clara Fowler. Well, I can tell you from what I've read in this book, because I have, when I go out and do a preliminary on site, like I'm going out to do Saturday, I have a hundred question questionnaire that I go out with to mm -hmm. talk with people. There's, there's five or six questions that cover demonic infestations on there. I've taken stuff out of your book and added it to my questionnaire. Oh, why? <laughs> That's just great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah. Which, which, which part? You know, do you know the other thing that I would, it just crossed my mind? There's two things. One of the really stunning things that William James tracked in, speaking of like ob observation and whatnot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was the physiology of Clara Fowler in the demonic state. Mm -hmm. the, de the demon was always awake. 24 seven, seven, seven days a week, she knew everything, knew the dreams, knew everything about mm -hmm. Clara Fowler. Mm -hmm. Experienced no pain. You could do anything to her. It, it, the, she would say the body is like the clothes you wear. It means nothing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Body means nothing to me. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, never slept, was never sick, never ill. Mm -hmm. um, had Had incredible strength could, uh, it was inexhaustible. And basically mm -hmm. to take control of the body, the demonic presence would wear her down, would, wouldn't let her sleep, wouldn't mm -hmm. let her eat. When she looked at food, maggots would be crawling out of it, for example, you know? Mm -hmm. When she mm -hmm. tried to sleep, she'd have these hellish nightmares where, where demonic pre demons were, were posted on the side of the bed, looming over her bed. Mm -hmm. and. A little like the Mojave incident, the smell of sulfur. Right. The smell of sulfur is in both instances. The, the, the Hesses and Mojave incident talked about this, this heavy phosphorus smell. Like if you took mm -hmm. a sulfur, a burning match, you know, and just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they do the same. The, and the demonic president, they talk about this smell. The other thing is, and this is where it gets spiritual, mm -hmm. when the Hesses were in their most <clears throat> vulnerable and horrific state, being tormented by these aliens, mm -hmm. an angelic presence showed itself. They called it their comforter. Right. Was, literally an angel appeared and said, don't worry, you will survive this. Have faith in, in Jesus. You, you will... You will survive this your children will be all right mm -hmm. just you know don't, don't panic and of course they did panic but but it was it was comforting to them mm -hmm. and it seemed to calm everything down in this frenetic scenario that they were involved in well similarly clara fowler had visitations from uh, jesus christ and the and uh, the blessed virgin on a fairly regular basis and and it would be, I guess, the equivalent of a comforter, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so the stories sort of tie somehow, and UFOs and demonic possession tie somehow. It, it's hard to figure out exactly how, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but it's impossible to ignore the the connections, you know. Right, or you know, as a as an investigator yeah. doing this for as long as I have. You look at that, and maybe the demon itself is causing those things to appear too to calm her down to make her more susceptible. Yeah. As well, who knows, they're, right? They're good at that. They're good liars. You know, that, that that's what they do. Absolutely. No, it's uh, it's a, a crazy thing. As a matter of fact, just a, a coincidence, but typical of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you know, Lizzie Borden is an important part of this book, and right. uh, uh, Juan Corriero, who was uh, two murders and. Fall River, that my investigator, Bassett, uh -huh. you know, the city marshal, uh, had investigated. He investigated both the Lizzie Borden and the Juan Carriaro uh, murders, where there were 
two axe murders in a city that hadn't had a murder in 50 years, uh -huh. two incredibly violent axe murders within three miles of each other and within six months. And if you count the Fowler murders, you've got a whole slew of, of, of in Fall River, and we won't uh -huh. get into exactly right. where that comes from, but it's quite a coincidence. I turn on the television today, and for whatever reason, Unsolved Mysteries comes up all the time. <laughs> and so I usually, I just move to whatever I, I want. But this time I said, okay, I'll watch it. What do you think the segment was on? Just take a wild guess. Lizzie Borden? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I go like, this is unbelievable. I, I don't really watch Unsolved Mysteries very often. Right. I just was, I said, well, I'll kill a few minutes before the interview and, you know, maybe right. uh, have a Coke <laughs> or something. And, um, and this is what comes on. Just very, uh, more than a coincidence. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's hysterical. Yeah, it yeah. may not be a coincidence. Yeah, who the hell? Because, because you've been <laughs> yeah. dealing with this book for you know for as long as you have. I mean, this you got a lot of powers. It permeates. It permeates the air around you. It really does. Yeah. yeah, it really does. It really does. Do you think you know? Do you, do you think as a writer when you're writing something like this, and again, you know, you're you're, you're a former police, you know, you're, you're a former law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. But as a writer, did you think about putting any protection around yourself when you were working on this at all? You know, I'll be honest with you. Um, first of all, early along, no. I mean, I was just happy to have the story. And I didn't get in the depth, nearly the depth that uh -huh. uh, I, I did this time. This time I really, you know, really, uh, you know, went into the weeds about everything and, and got every little detail to, to, to corroborate things and to get the full story. Mm -hmm. This second time around, I have to say, um, I, I had no protections around me, but I have to say, it's on your mind. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. It's on your mind, and mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't go away easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Because I know, I like I said, I mean, even when I'm reading stuff like this, I don't know if I'm imagining stuff happening around me, or if if it's you know, if if if, if whatever it is that I'm reading about uh -huh. is, is is coming in while you know while I'm reading it. So I always make sure that I put some type of protection around me. You, you know, Charlotte, I have a tiny a bit of dialogue. I'd like to read. Maybe could I do that? Absolutely. This is this is from the demonic presence, and I think he's talking to. Uh, bear with me. Uh, Yeah, he's talking to uh, actually Leonora uh, Piper, the the, uh, the the clairvoyant. But this is her in her demonic state, and this is from the records. Mm -hmm. So she goes, he goes to her because she's a clairvoyant. The problem with you is you think you can communicate with one half of the spirit world and not the other. Women no different from you commit barbarous atrocities. I know you can trust what I tell you, and she sputters like, why? Why do I bother with someone like Clara Fowler? I do it because it's my job. God is dead, yet moment uh, G Jesus is in hell. Yet moment to moment, we fight for the souls of humans, sometimes by the thousands, often one at a time, each a small or momentous victory. And we celebrate those victories, he swore. Truly we do. She says, God. He goes, a tired general, incompetent, blithering. Angels have lost confidence in him knowing the power of the forces I command. It lowered its voice and spoke with scorn. I think the English would say he let his side down. It crept towards her. And this is the, this is the secret that I've learned. Another secret, it croaked. Most are borderline, but occasionally we come upon a special case. Borden, Holmes, the Ripper, countless wow. others whose names you will never know. And these by their own choosing become me evil incarnate prowling the earth with one purpose to reduce god's so-called creations to the brutish animals i know them to be that's incredible wow that's incredible wow so, and, and and so if, if, if there's something i've learned between transporting very very dangerous people it, as a as a um, a deputy sheriff and mm -hmm. writing this book and researching it it's it that, that evil is real. Good is real, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But evil is real. Yeah. 
And I can see why the psychiatrist got involved with this because when you talk about uh, Clara not sleeping mm-hmm. and not and not eating, that you know that's almost bipolar activity. And yeah. I can see why it was turned over to a psychiatrist because they're trying to figure out is she bipolar, is she schizophrenic, what's going on with this gal? Exactly. Now they called it neurasthenia at the time. That was mm-hmm. the and, and basically it was like a worn probably a lot like um anorexia. Mm-hmm. Probably a lot like that, where just the body just is withering, you know, because of lack of sleep, um, lack of um, food, and a tremendous stress, you know, stress. And um, and so that's how she came. Actually, another doctor, a regular doctor, Putnam, turned the case over to to uh, Prince, realizing that you said this is she. In medieval times, I, I would tell you she's possessed by devils. I mean, but we know that's not true. I know that you deal with abnormal psychiatry and study these things. So she's your patient. And that's how it started. Absolutely. I, I want to point out, I'm not a psychiatrist guy. So I'm, Nor just, am I. I'm saying stuff I've, saying stuff that I've learned, I've learned over the years from other people and in my experiences. But I mean, so a case like this, and I know the Catholic Church, and and, and you know, I, like I said, I, I've had two or three the demonic things that I've dealt with over the years, and I know how thorough the Catholic Church is before they even go in to do an exorcism. Yes. They're going to talk to the clinicians. They're going to talk to the psychiatrists. They're going to have somebody go out and look at the house that the person's in, and look at the land that the person's living on, before they before they even get involved with it. Uh, but you know, to your point earlier. There are more exorcisms performed now, mm-hmm. right now, than mm-hmm. probably in the last 50 years. There were, I think, maybe 10 or 12 exorcists in the United States that were right. bona fide by the Vatican uh, going back mm, 20 years. Mm-hmm. Going back, I'm sorry, go, going back, yeah, 20, mm-hmm. 25 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Today, there's 150 of them. And they reinstituted in the in the Vatican. They were all trained from all mm-hmm. over the world to cope with with um well with demonic possession you know and i i just wonder why the huge increase is it because we've got all these tv shows that are in movies and no offense in books that are showing <laughs> this stuff and it's making and i'm not saying that's what's causing it but maybe either the, the like the demon was saying somebody that has that that type of mind that it can enter yes and yeah. so as people are reading these books and looking at this stuff you know and hearing about this stuff it gets in their heads and then the demon is able to see, Hey, this person's really, you know, Mm -hmm. I I think that, uh, that exorcism, not necessarily by the Catholic church, but by other Mm -hmm. religious orders are very, uh, prominent outside the United States Mm -hmm. and places, South America, places like that, uh, Russia, um, Eastern Europe. Um, I think basically we've camouflaged a lot of things with, technology or technical names mm-hmm. you know so you put a name on it it doesn't mean you understand it right you take something as simple as light and we don't have any clue really how light happens why is there light we don't right. really know it's a kind of wave but from our point our point of view we see the light we see but we don't mm-hmm. see ultraviolet we don't see infrared we don't see radio waves we don't see microwaves so mm-hmm. we have an incredibly limited view of reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that the Western civil, modern Western civilization really is sort of poo-pooed religion and, and pushed it you know, down into a, a trash can pretty much mm-hmm. and replaced it with, with words. Mm-hmm. And, and and technical, but it doesn't mean you know what it is. It just says we've identified it. Mm-hmm. And there's a difference between understanding something and identifying that it exists. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, like you say, I mean, it's just been the last few years that you hear more and more about, you know, about, uh, about demons and, and possession. Yes. It's really gone up a lot now, whether that's because it's the church, as the Bible says, things are a changing. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> or it, it, you know, the internet, like everything else. Yeah. I mean, you go on the internet and see uh, exorcists, a priest, uh, bona fide exorcist interviewed, uh-huh. you know, and they'll tell you the stories that he's encountered. 
-hmm. I think that prior to the internet, you, you wouldn't be able to get a hold of that information. Right, so, right. so it might have been there, and maybe, uh, I, may, may, maybe, maybe the devil is loose. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. I mean, but I know, I know the cases have gone up. I know a lot of the calls we get, the people would like us to do a cleansing on them because they think there's some there's an evil spirit involved, and mm -hmm. we have to try and calm people down and say, look, we don't know yet. We have to get out there, yeah. and and see. I mean, we just can't come out and do a cleansing because we don't know what we're dealing with yet. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but, but I have definitely seen an increase in, in people. And that's why I say, because like, like they're able, like you say, they're able to see it on the internet, TV, read a book or whatever. It makes them more aware of what's out there too, because yeah, people weren't, weren't aware of it. Yeah. 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 You know, there's a great line uh, by Baudelaire. He says, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing people he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that had to do with what you're talking about. You know that that basically the whole idea i don't know in my parents age and, and yours probably too right the idea of a, a demons yeah there's a, a devil of course there's a devil mm -hmm. that's faded away but i'm not so sure that that belief is holding i think people see the these days see the um the limitations mm -hmm. of science and technology i mean just trying to get somebody to talk to you on the telephone these days right Right. Does it give you a lot of faith in technology? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that that people are starting to understand, including physicists, and mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, uh, prominent uh, physicists and scientists that that science has its limitations. Mm -hmm. There's something beyond. It, it goes this far, but no mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. And the basic questions: Why are we here? You know, uh, what is consciousness? Um, do we have a soul? These questions, you know, were a asked hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and they'll probably be asked hundreds of years from now. Absolutely. And I'm glad, and I'm, like you say, I'm glad that there's more scientists and psych psychologists and regular mm -hmm. doctors who are, are looking into this stuff and understanding it more. Yes. You know, you're going to get a kick out of this. You want to, you want to hear something a little funny. Let's hear it. So, uh, so I had, I had had a dream. People asked me while I was writing the Mojave incident afterwards, uh -huh. have you ever had a UFO experience? And sort of out of hand, I would say no. Uh -huh. But that isn't exactly true, I suppose, because I had a really vivid, vivid dream um, 30 years ago. I had a dog and I would walk him early in the morning, maybe four in the morning or so, because I, I was taking a lot of flights and I had a, a long drive to the airport, et cetera. So I would be out early in the morning. This was near the ocean and there was a big pond. And in my dream anyway, I, I uh, was walking the dog. I saw this shiny object, UFO, in the pond, at the bottom of the pond. Mm -hmm. It was winter near the ocean, so it was very cold. And I had this compulsion in the dream to dive in, and I did. And uh, when I went, I was escorted through the UFO and shown maps and things like that. And this was the dream. And I remember looking at my watch, which had stopped. And then I found myself again with the dog on the leash, standing over the edge of the pond in the dream. But it was very vivid and it stuck with me for a long, long time. So then uh, it was really happenstance that I found the Hesses and the story for Mojave incident. A friend of a friend, a guy that worked for me, knew them and that I, I said I didn't want to really do it. I wasn't interested. Uh, then uh, so it, a very involved, complicated and unlikely story got me to the Mojave incident, which mm -hmm. again uh, made me relook at things. I went to the uh, doctor for some uh, a knee problem and uh, he performed surgery. And after the surgery, he said, um, I want to show you something. He showed me an x-ray. And in the x-ray was this like arrow head, smaller than an arrow head, about the size of the nail on your pinky. And it was a silver shiny. He said, you have a piece of metal lodged in your knee. And I tried to get it, but I, I couldn't get it out. And I didn't, I didn't want to screw up my, my surgery to get that out. And it seems like it's not bothering you because you don't know about it and it, you know it doesn't hurt or anything so i i left it in 
He says, but I want you to know that this thing is it. about a week later, I'm watching a television program about alien abduction. Right. <laughs> and this guy says he's been abducted and the guy is interviewing me. He said, and look, I have this x-ray and this is an implant that I have in my knee. And they show the x-ray, I go, that's my x-ray. So one of the doctors, uh, Dr. Perry Kelly, who is a retrogressive hypnotist and a medical doctor, uh -huh. wrote a review for, for The Unwelcome. So we got to be friends through a book club. Uh -huh. He wrote it. It's an extraordinary journey into the uncharted depths of the human mind. So I said, Perry, would you retrogress me to the day of that dream? And so in May, he's going to retrogress me. We're going to videotape it and see if there's something more to this dream and this series of coincidences uh, that more than meets the eye. And I just, I just thought that might be fun for you to know. Oh, my gosh. We're going to have to get you on after that. <laughs> because it sounds to me like you got a tracker in your in your knee. It sounds that way to me, too. But uh, I'm not going to say anything. Who knows? But but certainly this. I said, so how would this get there? He goes, he goes I don't know. I mean, I would say that somebody left a surgical tool, but it's not a surgical tool. I would say that maybe uh, the tip of a scalpel broke off or something like that. And during the sur the prior surgery, but that seems unlikely to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean they wow. both seem unlikely, but but, but here we are. <laughs> wow! Oh yeah, we're definitely gonna have to get you back for that after that one. So uh, so yeah, so we'll videotape it, and um, and uh, it should be fascinating. Absolutely. See, and I was just gonna ask you what's next for you, but I guess we got the. We got that answer. And you know what I think I'm going to call the book? Truth. There you go. Just truth. Very simple, you know. And uh, and the truth is, again, there's a lot more, uh, like they say in Shakespeare, right? There are a lot more, uh, you know, than you've dreamed of, Horatio, you know, in the, in the, in the universe. You know, there are more things than you, you could ever dream of in the universe. And I wow. think that's true. Wow, wow, wow. So when does this book come out? Come, you'll be able to order it March 15th on um, Amazon and, and uh, all of them, you know, all of the regulars and bookstores. Mm -hmm. And then um, it'll be on bookshelves uh, in early May. But, you know, I'm really, if you can pre-order it, that's, the, that's probably great. Okay, cool. And so we've got some trailers that we've done and um, the publisher's been great. It's uh, mm -hmm. Black Rose and they've really been, really been uh, very supportive. And helpful so uh we're looking to oh who knows maybe maybe it'll be a movie it's very cinematic i think that right right yeah. where can people find you sir well i have a, a website uh just ronfelber.com that's easy r-o-n-f-e-l-b-e-r.com and uh, i have a you know number of things on the internet you know on youtube i've done a number of speeches and things of that nature that uh and my books of course are you just go to amazon or any of them uh and uh, I, I guess at this point, I think I've, I've written about 13 of them. Yeah, you got so, quite a bit out there. Quite Absolutely. a few. Absolutely. But, but the two scary ones are Mojave Incident and The Unwelcome. <laughs> They're scary, guys, I'm telling you. All right, sir, it's always great to have you on, and we'll have to have you on after the book comes out. How's that sound? Oh, that would be great. That would be great, Charlotte. All right, fair enough. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Thank you. Tonight. It's always a pleasure. All right, you have a great one. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye bye all right, yeah, it's always great having him on. It's always fun having him on. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors of all time. And, uh, yeah, so we'll have to, you guys will have to get that book because I'm telling you, it, it, it kept me up, kept me up at night reading it. Okay, tomorrow Nancy Mass will be back with us, and we're going to have a movie discussion on a movie called Ghost Town. So that ought to be fun. Uh, you guys can start Googling YouTube to see what that movie's about. Because I've never even seen it either. So I'm going to be Googling YouTube to see what that movie's about. But I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And remember, I do have a psychic development class for uh, beginning psychic development on uh, March 10th. That's a Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific. So I can help out my East Coast friends out there so it's not so late. Uh, you can go to the California Haunts uh, Paranormal Investigation Team meetup site to find that. And all you got to do is Google in the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team meetup. Um, if you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, 
Share it with five of your enemies. Uh, we're equal opportunity here, just trying to get the word out. If you like the show and you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a smiley face, or, or a smiley face, or, or a heart, or something like that, just to, uh, help, to, help, to help us spread out to more people. Spread out to more people. But anyway, I will be back at 6.30 p.m. Pacific tomorrow with, Nan with Medium Nancy Mass. I hope you guys have a great evening, and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye.